evening and welcome to What's Your Story. My name is Catherine Mwangi. We're here tonight at the residence of His Excellency Okaniwa Ken. He is Japan's ambassador to Kenya. Thank you so much, sir, for your willingness to share your story. Our countries have a relationship that spans six decades. Um, how would you describe um, the strength of the relationship between Kenya and Japan? Oh, that's a very uh, good question, but difficult to answer. Okay. Because uh, there are so many uh, bonds of friendship between our two peoples. It, this relation is not only about two governments, mm -hmm. but it's also about people at the grassroots. Uh -huh. And there have been, there is a lot of uh, stories of uh, friendship between individuals yes. over two countries. Yes. Okay, you've been here uh, for how many months or years? I know you're very, very young in Kenya. I've been here for uh, just over one year and a half. Okay, so one and a half years. So for someone watching who may not have a clue or an understanding mm -hmm. of what exactly an ambassador does, mm. enlighten us on that. Okay, well, the, uh, the ambassador is uh, the representative of the Japanese government uh, in this country. Yes. And so I have, uh, I have discussions with your president and the members of the government. I also reach out to counties and I talk to the governors. I also meet with many uh, uh, people from different circles of the society mm -hmm. to talk about how we can uh, deepen our friendship mm -hmm. and our cooperation. Mm -hmm. So I have a very uh, much an overview of uh, your society and your government. Yes, and, and your country, Japan, the country that you represent uh, here in Kenya, has done some um, really amazing and remarkable work could you speak to some of what those are and perhaps even name or mention some industries? One of the things that we have supported is uh, uh, geothermal power plant in Okaria. And today, as a result of our support, not just the construction of the power plants, but also the building the capacity of the people who are running those uh, power plants, uh, Kenya has, uh, is a leader in uh, renewable energy in Africa. Mm -hmm. And also they are able to uh, look for geothermal resources in other parts of Africa. Okay. So you are very uh, self-reliant and uh, this is uh, as a result of our long-standing cooperation. Yes, and what about um, JICA? JICA, well, JICA is a, a short abbreviation for Japan International Cooperation Agency, mm -hmm. and they are the arm of the government which implements mm -hmm. our assistance programs. Oh, I see. And that has been established in Kenya since the establishment of the embassy here. Yes, we, we work, uh, well, they work uh, under our supervision. Yes. And they've been here for a very long time. Yes. Okay. So um, give us a breakdown of what your day looks like. What, what, for example, what's your morning routine like? Well, I don't really have a routine because it depends on the people I meet. Okay. But I will meet with members of the government mm -hmm. uh, to talk about uh, the various cooperation we have. We also, I also reach out to the members of the parliament and uh, we discuss what is on the agenda for the, uh, the two houses of your legislature. Mm -hmm. I also reach out to people like yourselves in the media and talk about what, uh, what Japan uh, is trying to do to support the, the African countries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then from, okay, uh, from time to time, I... Uh, attend a ceremony to uh, uh, open a new uh, center for disease or a open or inaugurate a uh, sort of some achievements that we have had bilaterally. Right. Okay. That sounds pretty busy. <laughs> uh, what, what drove you or what inspired you to take up a career in foreign service? For that, uh, I, it goes back a little bit long way. Yes. Um, so in the uh, 1970s, when I was a child, my uh, 
father was uh, a trade, working uh, in a trading company, and uh, with him we went to live in New York. Okay. And every school in New York uh, goes on a field trip to the United Nations headquarters. Okay. And that was when I saw the flags of so many countries. Mm -hmm. That was when I maybe, I thought uh, I like to work in uh, some place like this. Oh. So that probably is the uh, beginning of uh, how I came to uh, uh, become uh, interested in working mm -hmm. for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Right. And so what steps did you take then after, after high school? Uh, what steps did you take to make sure, or rather to realize hmm. um, that dream, that inspiration? Well, we have exams to uh, enter the uh, government, and so I, uh, I had to study for that, mm -hmm. and I was accepted. Okay, and your journey then started. So could you take us through a, a career journey, specifically your career journey, and some mm -hmm. of the uh, places that you have worked at serving Japan mm -hmm. in different parts? Uh, when I joined the ministry, everyone has a language, specialized uh, language. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, was uh, picked to do uh, English, which is not so interesting, but, I, that, but the government sent me to study at Oxford University. Uh, following that, uh, I came back to Tokyo, um, and then I spent about 10 years in Tokyo. And uh, I think I did quite a few things, but I was dealing with uh, uh, Law of the Sea, which is about uh, international law, which regulates the maritime domain. I did uh, the uh, promoting uh, export controls for strategic goods mm -hmm. against uh, the former communist countries. I also, uh, uh, and later on, uh, I, uh, I was in a, a development cooperation. So, you know, we looked at how can we effectively support developing countries uh, like uh, Kenya. Mm -hmm. And I was also heavily involved at one point with the climate change negotiations in the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So mm -hmm. those are some of the work, but I also was the deputy spokesman for foreign affairs, so I have a lot of uh, dealing with people like yourselves mm -hmm. in the media. <laughs> okay. So to be a high-ranking diplomat, you know, at ambassador level like yourself, what are some of the important skill sets one must have in order to be an efficient and effective a diplomat? Uh, I think in terms of the skills, mm -hmm. uh, it's not so different from any other uh, job, uh, namely that you need to be able to write a good report on some issues, you need to be able to express yourself in front of others when you're making a speech, uh, you need to be uh, able to negotiate with others and uh, anyone in business or other work, we will do that at some point. Um, and, uh, and then when you're at the uh, ambas ambassador level, uh, I think you also need to be very sociable and you need to be liked <laughs> by uh, others. And that's maybe uh, one of the uh, particular features of being an ambassador in a country. Right. So being liked is important? Yes. Oh, why? To avoid being uh, not liked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What does a bad day in an ambassador's life look like? Mm, well, I'm not sure what would be a bad day. You know, there are many types. So uh, you might have some uh, projects being uh, obst uh, obstructed or in some way, or you might have a, an accident or, uh, you know, like an airplane crash, or, or there might be a terrorist attack. But, you know, many things happen in our daily lives. And uh, so one just hopes that uh, these things do not happen when you're on the job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's what you hope for every day. Um, Japan and Kenya, you've been here now for a year and a half, and your career journey also has, you know, has had uh, elements where you worked, you know, with, you had experience working with different countries, mm -hmm. right? So 
what are the similarities between our two countries? How, are there any similarities mm. between Kenya and Japan? Uh, I think that uh, we, uh, the two peoples, the uh, Kenyan people, uh, I think, I, I have found that mm -hmm. many, most Kenyan people are quite like uh, the Japanese. Okay. Uh, in uh, several sense, one is uh, Kenyans are very friendly uh, towards uh, people who come from other countries and they may, and you may not be so uh, uh, vocal, mm -hmm. but you are very kind. And, uh, and when one is being asked to do a task, uh, a Kenyan would very much work hard to do his or his or her best mm -hmm. uh, at that task. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, you know, these are some of the uh, characteristics of uh, Japanese. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and both countries do not have uh, any energy or mineral resources. Okay. So it is, it is the human resources mm -hmm. that is building a country. Yes. And so I very much feel that the success of Kenya relies on the human resources, which is exactly the same as Japan's. Right. And, and in Japan, though, I mean, um, to be the world's, what, third biggest economy means that the human resource must be levels higher. So we may be similar in that way, but what are some of the characteristics or attributes that have made the Japanese the world's third biggest economy? Uh, I think it is only because of the way we, uh, I guess, systematically mm -hmm. built up the country mm -hmm. and the people also are part of that success story. Um, because the way we, we first tried our best to, uh, in the 1800s, late 1800s, mm -hmm. we became from a uh, shogunate, the mm -hmm. uh, feudal, feudal country, to a modern nation. We tried to avoid being colonized mm -hmm. by building our navy and the army. And uh, in order to do so, we had to build a, uh, the ships and the tanks, and we also had to build the transportation network, the railway transportation network. Mm -hmm. But in order to achieve this and become a strong nation mm -hmm. capable of uh, avoiding uh, colonization, we had to bring in a lot of Western technology. Okay. So we invited uh, Western scholars to teach in Japanese universities. And then from then on, we basically built up our, our human capacity. Mm. And, uh, and if you teach, an teach a Japanese to be heavy industry engineers, they are the ones who will build the shipping, shipbuilding industry or the locomotive industry. So by doing education linked to the industries that we were determined to build, mm -hmm. we really became the top nation in shipbuilding, top nation in uh, engineering, top nation in all many other things. And this is, uh, so basically, systematic address, addressing these issues systematically. Mm -hmm. And also people, of course, in terms of individuals, we were quite diligent. Mm. So how does a nation then rise up to that level of diligence a very strong work ethic. How, how do you think, or what do you think needs to happen, especially for nations in this continent, mm -hmm. generally speaking, where you drive a whole people into one common cause mm. and everybody just follows that? Yes, well, I, I, don't, think, <laughs> I don't think it's a, a top-down approach, mm -hmm. uh, because if you, so, if you look at individuals in Japan, mm -hmm. so everyone is trying to do better. Yeah. Children are trying to do better at school. The, their parents are trying to do better at their jobs. The government is trying to do better to serve the people. So, so, so at various levels, mm -hmm. from the top to the bottom, I think people in general are motivated so even if you're going, if you're ever in Japan and you go to a restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, you would think that 
the the uh, waitresses or the waiters, you know, they try to do their best. Mm -hmm. uh, not because they are being uh, paid a lot, mm -hmm. but because they feel that as that is their duty to do best best at what they do. Mm. So if you have everyone in society trying to do best at what they do, the total of that mm. <laughs> sum obviously will be very high high quality, you know, high quality services, high quality uh, jobs. Yeah. And, uh, so, and there's opportunity if one tries one's best. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no obstacles. You can do, you can go as high as you can if yeah. on the basis of your capability. Yes. And this is not the case for many countries. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a human nature. Mm -hmm. if, if there are opportunities, if one can try one's best and then they can really go to the top, yeah. people are motivated. Yes. So this is the reason why as a democracy and as a country with rule of law, people will thrive if they do their best. They will be rewarded. But if it's a country which does not have that kind of opportunity, there will be distortions. Those are pretty profound um, statements you've made there. Because in terms of, so what you've said is, performance is rewarded and there's room to, uh, to go you know, for mm -hmm. promotion room for promotion. So let's talk about some of the cultural norms um, that you have in Japan. Mm -hmm. so they're actually global norms. It's just that there's, there's just so many uh, to go through when I was you know, researching for our story. And we'll, t we'll start with health, first of all. So the Japanese are literally ageless. You know? So you meet people who are over 100 mm -hmm. years. They don't even mm -hmm. look. They don't look it. They're working hard. They're standing upright. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the work-life balance, so you find these traditions. Families are very steeped in tradition mm -hmm. in as much as Japan is a modern nation. Mm -hmm. So you find there's, there's no confusion, more or less, from, at least from what we see outside in. Mm -hmm. So could you speak to some of the cultural norms of the Japanese and how these have helped develop the people? Mm, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I, uh, I agree with uh, the uh, cultural norms. Mm -hmm. uh, some aspects of the Japanese society is, uh, I think, has helped mm -hmm. Japan to develop, uh, such as the uh, Japanese being a uh, sort of a relatively uh, single people nation that there is, uh, it, it's easier to have consensus on many things. Okay. Um, and, uh, and also the, uh, it is easy to have discipline and to, re to try to have more discipline in the population that they work together more harmoniously. Mm -hmm. um, but then we also have, you know, the downside of that is that there's uh, maybe a certain lack of uh, diversity uh, within the uh, people in Japan or the culture in Japan and that people and the culture does not uh, uh, attach so much importance to being different from others. Okay. So I'm not sure. I think this is a downside because if you have cultural diversity or diversity in your country, um, that means that there are people who are good at different things. Mm. So as a total, the society will be stronger mm. and maybe more resilient. Right, and, and the ageless factor? Well, the ageless factor is, it's, it's a result of, uh, well, any human being wants to be, be healthy. Um, but it's just that the, uh, I think the government and also the people themselves are careful about uh, avoiding being sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, even uh, also, we teach uh, nutrition at school. Oh. And also, even if people are already grown up, they also are interested and they read and uh, uh, think about how to keep uh, healthy. Yeah. So that the uh, occurrence, occurrence of the uh, non-communicable disease is, I think, controlled. Now, I find that, uh, so unless 
when countries become more affluent, mm -hmm. the population will obviously be able to have more food to eat and will probably live longer, but it will not be quite good if they're not, they're not healthy mm -hmm. when they're living longer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, noticed that uh, Kenya has a, will have a huge problem with non-communicable disease because your population is getting older mm -hmm. or living longer. Right. Yet we have arable land where we plant organic foods. So we have obviously great capacity and potential to eat healthy right? Not just Kenya, in fact, Africa. We don't have the problem of, um, um, we actually have a good, a good problem with mm. natural foods. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that we are not living as long as perhaps our brothers in Japan, our sisters in Japan, mm. uh, speaks to a problem somewhere. Well, it's, it's quite a complicated issue. Okay. Um, uh, because uh, keeping healthy is a question of whether you have, you go to the hospital for regular checkups, uh, whether you are vaccinated when there is a disease which is being spread around. Mm. And, and of course, you know, there are the uh, issues of uh, are you eating uh, healthy food or not? Um, but, or are you taking uh, good exercise? So it's quite complicated. I'm not a doctor, so <laughs> I'm not going to go into detail. Yeah, okay. So we'll be taking a very short commercial break. Uh, to you watching, we'll be back after this commercial break. Don't go too far. When we come back, we get to learn more about His Excellency, as well as more details about Japan. What opportunities could uh, Kenyans take advantage of in Japan, and how do we do that right after the break? With all this hard work you're putting in, serving the mm -hmm. country in different, you know, spaces, so when did you find the time to start a family? I didn't find my wife. My mother found her first. Oh. And uh, because my mother was uh, teaching uh, Japanese to foreigners, okay. and my wife also was teaching, and she, my mother, you know, introduced me to her. So that was the beginning. Welcome back. It's What's Your Story here on KTN Home. We are having a conversation with His Excellency Okaniwa Ken. He is Japan's ambassador to Kenya. And so, sir, now I want us to go into way back into your childhood. <laughs> okay. So, what are some of the beautiful memories you carry, you know, about your childhood that have formed the person, the man that you are today? I think when I was a... Uh more. Mm -hmm. I was quite shy okay. uh, um, and uh, I was not sociable and so I was often uh, reading books at home when, uh, you know, not when others were playing uh, out on the streets. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it's quite a... So I, will, I wouldn't be doing this job yeah. if I was not paid to speak in front of others. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> So, so a shy child who was not sociable got into a field where uh, earlier on you said you have to be sociable, you have to be liked, you have to be out there, you have to be a good negotiator. So when did the change happen for you? Well, I actually didn't know that I had to be sociable when I was joining the government. Yes. But the essence of my work in the uh, government uh, for example, when we are trying to support development of uh, Kenya, is having a good analysis of what does this country need, uh. which we can offer, uh -huh. so that it could become self-reliant. Mm -hmm. So this is not nothing. It has nothing to do with uh, being liked or being sociable. Mm -hmm. And also when I was negotiating the, uh, the uh, Kyoto Protocol in the, uh, in the climate change negotiations, it's, it's basically about achieving your, uh, promoting your national interest 
uh, which is often against the national interest or the interest of other countries. Mm -hmm. So this is really, you know, very hard uh, negotiations. Mm -hmm. And for that, you need a lot of uh, skills in uh, negotiations. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with being uh, <laughs> liked. liked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's it's about the interests of your country yes. at that time, at that point. But moving from a shy a shy child to a confident speaker mm. and a strong negotiator, where where did that you know connection happen? Where when did that change for you? Mm, uh, well, maybe uh, living living as a child in the U.S. Ah. Uh, probably helped because I was just basically you know thrown into the. Uh, on the street with other American children, and then I had I didn't speak any English, mm -hmm. so one has to survive. So in that sense, I think I uh, was able to become very adaptable uh -huh. to different situations. Yes, adaptability. Because when I went back to Japan, then it was very difficult because the education level in Japan is much higher, mm -hmm. and my Japanese was not as good. So I really struggled to uh, catch up with the uh, other students. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had very difficult period, both in the U.S. and then coming back. So being able to adapt to those kind of difficulty yes. uh, is something that a normal child in Japan yeah. would never experience. Hmm. And yet you did and overcame that. And, but I still made it. So. <laughs> and you still made it, yes. So. In your career as, you know, um, rising up through the ranks all the way to now um, ambassador level, what are some of the moments you're most proud of? There have always been, a, at some point, a sense of achievement. Yeah. One thing that I think I achieved is uh, I, we were negotiating the uh, rules mm -hmm. for implementing the Kyoto Protocol on mm -hmm. climate change. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, agree on, on the rules as a result of very difficult negotiations. Mm. And then we had to take the agreement back to our diet, which is the parliament, mm -hmm. and get the members to agree to ratify the disagreement. Mm -hmm. But it puts a lot of uh, burden on the uh, Japanese companies vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Americans, because the Americans did not decide to leave the, uh, this negotiations. So, but still we had to, uh, because we thought that this would be beneficial from, for the international community, mm -hmm. and also it's an important step to fight climate change, we decided to ratify, and I had a very difficult time uh, explaining to the uh, individuals in the parliament that this is, uh, we need to ratify this agreement, and we managed to do that. Mm. So that was one of the, uh, I guess, one of the highlights of uh, my career. Right. So in this day and age, how many hours a day does a you know, typical Japanese worker put in? Uh, typical is difficult to say what is typical, but uh, basically, you know, Japanese work at least 40 hours per week. 40 per week, so that's yeah. like what? Per week? Eight we days per day. So that's the standard. Okay, standard, yes. Yeah, but, yes. but most people, you know, do overtime. Really? Yeah. Okay, so, and, and you just mentioned your wife a few sentences ago. Um, so with all this hard work you're putting in, serving the mm -hmm. country in different, you know, spaces, so when did you find the time to start a family? I didn't find my wife, my mother, found her first, oh. and uh, because my mother was uh, teaching uh, Japanese to foreigners, okay. and my wife also was teaching in the same like uh, association, mm -hmm. uh, teaching Japanese. So they, they knew each other before I knew her, and she, my mother you know, introduced me to her. <laughs> so that was the beginning. Wow, that's amazing. So with all the work you're doing, so there's family and there's work, and you're working hard. Mm -hmm. You're committed to what you're doing. You're putting in uh, incredible hours. And then here you have uh, your wife and, and children? Yes. Yes. 
So how did you, how did you make sure both are taken care of, especially the family front? Well, I try my, at least when I'm not working, I try to spend uh, time with them, go, go on a holiday with them, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that's how you unwind. Mm. Okay, so a holiday every so often. Well, when I have, when I'm able to take them. When yes. you have time. Okay, wow. Okay, so the work ethic is very, very strong with the Japanese. I see. So in the course of your career, you have had, obviously, as with any other career, uh, challenges, numerous challenges. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate those difficult times? Mm -hmm. mm. Well, first of all, I think it's a question of uh, trying to keep your team together mm -hmm. and that people are motivated to work or harmon cooperate in mm -hmm. working together. This is very important when, uh, when one is leading uh, you know, a team. And, uh, and also, I think, having courage mm -hmm. is very important because uh, one is all, so from time to time you find that there are some very difficult uh, challenges that may seem, you know, almost impossible to overcome. Mm. And so one is often intimidated and one, you know, one may become, in, you know, not being able to think of how to get around mm -hmm. an obstacle. Uh, and, uh, but looking back, I think, one of the important things that one learns is that in those circumstances, uh, a, a person's courage, having a courage to say, okay, let's try to address it, mm. and then to lead, uh, to have others follow you, is uh, probably one of the most important things that uh, someone in a management position can do. Mm. So the courage to, to make decisions. I see. Okay, so let's get um, a little bit into um, philosophy. So what's your philosophy generally on life? There is a Japanese proverb mm -hmm. which uh, is uh, literally translated uh, one moment, one encounter. And this is a teaching from the traditional Japanese uh, way of tea, the tea ceremony. Mm -hmm which uh, tells you that this moment that we are facing together now yeah. will never happen again because tomorrow you are a different person and so we need to be appreciate the encounter that we have now and to appreciate the moment that we share together. Mm. And this teaches us that time or your life is finite. Mm -hmm. So what do you do in this limited amount of time? So I have learned that I will try, I want to try to uh, uh, use the best of my time, try to be with people I like, and even if I'm with people I don't necessarily like, I try to make the best of my time with anyone. <laughs> Yes. Uh, but I find that, you know, my time uh, in Kenya, I enjoy very much. You, you know, do? Meeting many nice, nice people, kind to me, and so on. Okay. And, okay, so speaking of Kenya, which, which places have you been to besides Nairobi? Uh, I, am, I have visited maybe about 18 counties. Oh. So far. Uh, wow. We have the same number of... Uh, Prefectures. We have 47 prefectures ah. and you have 47 counties. Yes. And I feel that it's very important, you know, when I'm meeting with people, there are many people in other counties mm. and they have different uh, cultures or different circumstances. So I'm trying to meet as many governors as possible, as many uh, parliamentarians as possible, and also to visit them. Mm -hmm. So I, visit, I have visited. Uh, and met about 18. Ah, wow, 18. That's, that's 18 quite counties. a number. So I'm trying to achieve 47. I'm, I'm still quite a, <laughs> there's still a long list. Okay, okay. It's good to have that vision anyway. Okay, so back to philosophy. What's your philosophy on families? I feel very responsible, you know, f 
for my children, yeah. but I cannot help them when they are grown up. Mm. Uh, and I f very much feel that, you know, I try to, we, well, both of us, my, me and my wife, try to do our best to give them the best opportunity for education and so on. But I feel that at the end of the day, they, are in, they become mature person and they are independent. But uh, I think uh, what we try to, uh, even though we don't tell them what to do, mm. what we try to show them how we are trying our mm. best to uh, live uh, as the best we can. Yeah. And I find that uh, the children may have learned to do that. Mm. So I'm, I'm very proud that you know, I have been able to do that. Okay, before I ask you one last philosophy question, tell me what you're reading now. I don't usually read uh, serious books. Mm -hmm. I usually read books for, you know, entertainment. Oh, really? So, uh, you know, I don't usually read, uh, you know, the classics so much. Okay. Um, or the serious books. No. And, uh, so I, I like reading entertaining So books. fiction? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah, fiction. Oh, is that so? Yes. <laughs> oh, I would never have imagined. Mm. Okay, that's pretty cool. Because I'm, I'm dealing with everything that is... True. Yes. Facts. <laughs> figures. So when I'm having some time off, I try to enjoy. <laughs> yes, I get you. So it's one of the ways the you unwind. Yes, yes. Got that. Okay. Your, so my last philosophy question, we have established you're not a philosopher, but this is just like the mantras you live by, your beliefs about these you know, topics. Uh, your philosophy on money. First of all, if I wanted to make a lot of money, mm -hmm. I would never have chose this job. Because oh. the, government in, the government people in Japan, mm -hmm. they are paid the lowest. So even though we are the top, you know, only the, really the top people mm -hmm. are accepted into government, yes. the pay is lowest, lower than the private sector. Oh, I see. And the fact that the government jobs uh, attract the best talent mm. uh, tells a lot about, you know, how the Japanese feel uh, their responsibility to, uh, to the country. Right. Um, I think it's probably similar in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is that we attract the best talent, they do not. Um, but, uh, but I think money is something that if you have money, you will be better off. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you don't, then you can make the best of what you have. Mm -hmm. and, and definitely, it's not the most important thing in your life. Mm, it's not the most important yeah, thing. Yeah, you, you need to make the best of what you have. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it's not the most important thing in your life. What do you consider the most important thing in life? The most important thing in life? That's a difficult question. Um, friendships, mm. family, mm -hmm. uh, your own health, mm -hmm. and uh, these are everything, or oh, you cannot buy these with money. <laughs> yes. You can help if you had more money, mm. uh, but you cannot really buy it. Yeah. Friendships, family, health. I like that. Okay, so as, as we wind up, sir, um, what in our country, Kenya, and you've lived here a year and a half, and you've also been exposed to, of, of course, other nations, mm -hmm. what, is, what would you tell young people in this country? What should our focus be? My impression being here for a year and a half mm. is that there is a lot of uh, influence of the uh, British education, which is not good for the country. Okay. Because I have noticed that the best people, the brightest people go into finance, medical uh, profession, uh, or maybe legal. But these are not, these people who are in these professions are not going in, are not the ones who will build an economy, mm -hmm. uh, like manufacturing or engineering. And uh, because if, Kenya is a country without any uh, natural resources. Uh, then you need to find, uh, you know, what is the engine of your economy. And uh, I think, uh, it, well, in the case of the, in Japan, it is the 
manufacturing in, and engineering industries. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think those two industries are just as important as legal or medical or uh, uh, um, law. Mm -hmm. And uh, law, medical, and uh, financial sector supports the uh, economy, but mm -hmm. they are not the engines. Mm -hmm. So I think there is, uh, there is a need, I think the young people should think about how do they, how are they going to sort of be the, promote the engine of the Kenya economy. Mm -hmm. This is making things, mm -hmm. building roads, building bridges. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and I think for that, I think you cannot just have people who are low educate people going into you know making furniture and so on. If you have the best people doing these jobs, you will have a strong economy because you have a very intelligent, educated population. Mm. And so we are trying to help that, but I, unless the young people think that they want to go into these areas, mm -hmm. uh, it will not happen. Yeah, okay, that's quite sobering. And, and for those looking to uh, you know, extend and fly their wings into Japan. What opportunities, or rather, what educational, what subjects would be brilliant for them to study in Japan? Uh, well, first of all, we accept, uh, we have uh, government scholarships. Mm -hmm. So every year, well, not, not many people, every year about 10, 8 or 7 people come on a J Japanese government scholarship to study in Japan. In addition, there are sort of uh, Japanese universities which have an exchange program. Mm -hmm. So if the Kenyan student is in uh, maybe like a Nairobi University mm -hmm. and he's, he or she is paying the, a fee, then mm -hmm. he can go take a year off and go to Japan and study okay. in a Japanese counterpart university. Okay. So there are those opportunities. Yeah. Um, and of course, I think one of the things that I see lacking is that you know, most Kenyans who go abroad, they go to the U.S. or Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Japan is far, far away and we don't have much of a historical link, but there are many people who feel very uh, interested in Kenya. Because if you ask anyone on the street in Japan, you know, do you know any country in Africa? They'll say they know Kenya. Oh. And uh, they love the safaris in Kenya and they always watch it on TV. Uh, and, uh, and I think the, uh, there is a total imbalance in the uh, peop number of people who go to Japan from this country compared to the number of the Japanese. Even, even though not many Japanese come here, but there's total imbalance. Mm. There are like 10 times more Japanese coming here for mm -hmm. business, some for tourism, mm -hmm. but I think both Kenyans need to see what Japan is like. Right. It's a different country from any other in the Western world. And I think the way we built, we built our country uh, using our own resources, but that was, it's only human resources. Hmm. So for a Kenyan uh, seeking to travel to Japan, if I wanted to go there, I've never been there. Where, where, where would I start? What are the things I need to go see, enjoy, learn? Okay, well, that's an easy question. You have to first come to the embassy of Japan and apply for a visa. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And after that? And you probably uh, land in Tokyo, and mm -hmm. then you can maybe see the modern capital. But you can also see the uh, ancient capital, which is Kyoto. Okay. in the middle of the country. Okay. And they have a lot of uh, old uh, temples and old buildings. Ah, so for, as, for, as a tourist, it is... Yes, as a tourist. It's perfect to go as yes. a tourist. As a student? As a student, we have a lot of uh, many uh, universities. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are many choices. Okay, there are many choices, I see. Well, any final words, Ambassador Ken? Uh, yes, uh, this is the sixtieth anniversary of our diplomatic relations yes and uh, and there are many it's not just a story of government to government cooperation 
it's also about individuals' friendship. Mm -hmm. And we are going to uh, organize a photo uh, exhibition of these six years, mm -hmm. perhaps in November. Mm -hmm. So we hope that uh, maybe your crew can visit mm -hmm. the exhibition. Definitely. So is that an invitation? Yes, you can cover it. <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, this was a pleasure to just sit here with you and listen to your story and your thoughts. Um, about our relationship uh, between Kenya and Japan and, and also your thoughts on different aspects of life. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Karibu. Thank you. Oh, you know Swahili? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you just said Karibu. Okay. And to you watching, Asante Sana for making the time tonight to watch. I hope you've had a glimpse of what is in Japan or what what Japan is about through the eyes of His Excellency Ambassador Okaniwa Ken. He is Japan's ambassador to Kenya. Until next week, take care of yourselves. And how do we say goodbye in Japanese? Sayonara. 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 Huh? Sayonara. Sayonara. That way. Okay. Okay. Maybe maybe it's not a good word. But but you. This is a this is a this is a program. You may say. You should say, see you again. No, I want Japanese. No? In, in, in Japanese? Yes. Uh, それではまた、OK, it becomes a little bit wrong. It's fine. So, you say it, say yeah. it on my behalf. Look here and say it on my behalf. OK. Mm -hmm. それではまた次の番組でお会いしましょう。